In this video, I'm going to talk about the assumptions associated with the paired samples t-test. So the first assumption I describe in the textbook is random sampling. That's true of essentially all inferential statistics. And I mentioned that the way to think about random sampling is that all members of the population of interest must have an equal chance of being selected into the sample. And I mentioned that this is rarely ever satisfied in practice. And the study on GPA measured at time one and time two, pre-learning how to set goals and post-setting goals, this study was based on a convenient sample because it's just a group of students who volunteered to participate in a study at a single university. So they're clearly not a representation of the population of all university students. But as I mentioned previously in the textbook, Virtually no studies satisfy the assumption of random sampling because we use convenience samples and we don't know the impact on the validity of the p-value we get, but we just assume that it's not too bad, but we really don't know. Another assumption is independence of observations. It's easy to confuse that one in the paired sample t-test case because paired data are obviously not independent. And by that I mean that there's usually a correlation, a positive one, between the scores at time one and the scores at time two in a within subjects design. So somebody who does well at uni in semester one is probably going to do well at uni in semester two. And so you get a positive correlation between the scores, and that's fine. That is not the assumption of independence of observations. It doesn't go from here to here. The assumption of independent observations goes from here to here. So this person's score is not influenced by this score, or this score, or that score. All these cases are independent from each other. They do not actually influence each other. Now, in the vast majority of studies, this assumption will be satisfied entirely, and you don't even have to really think about it, because the cases really are independent from each other, providing answers without any discussion from each other, or those sorts of things. I suppose the only time you might come across a study where the assumption is violated is where people use twins, identical twins, as cases in their sample. And so this twin and this twin will obviously be dependent in terms of what scores they're going to produce because they share so many genes and they share environment. So that would be one where you see that happen. And researchers often just use one of the twins from each pair to run a particular analysis if they're interested in something that's independent of heritability. So another assumption is dependent variable measured on a continuous scale. So we expect theoretically interval ratio data, which I've described at length in a previous chapter. But ordinal can be OK, too, I mentioned in the textbook. And this is a little bit controversial because some people would disagree. But there certainly is empirical evidence to support the notion that as long as your data have at least five points, like a Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree, then the paired sample t-test will probably give you a p-value that is accurate. Now, of course, there might be some qualifications to that, and there is some research that suggests that maybe it won't be quite accurate, but there's also research suggesting that it will be very closely accurate. So at this stage, I would say probably it's pr pretty good based on the review that I've done. Use five points or more. But if you have less than five points, I'd no longer trust the p-value from a regular paired sample t-test. Now, the next assumption is about normal distribution. And similar to the independent sample t-test, it's theoretically true that the scores have to be normally distributed. But what's different is that the emphasis is on the different scores. And so you don't actually have to evaluate normality for these two scores. So I could measure skew for GPA pre and post, skew and kurtosis and click OK. And I'll get an estimate of skew for both. But that's not the level at which you should be evaluating skew. You actually should be evaluating it for the different scores. And I'm going to do that in a separate video. I do mention that you can have a certain level of non-normality in your data. In fact, you can have a fair amount of non-normality and still get a, a p-value that is fairly accurate. And I write here that similar to the independent sample t-test, absolute skew of 2 or less and absolute kurtosis of 9.0 or less usually will give you a fairly accurate p-value and you do not inflate the alpha level of 0.05 that you might have specified for your analysis. Now the last assumption is about homogeneity of variance. 
Does the paired sample t-test assume homogeneity of variance like the independent sample t-test? So time one, time two variance, I could estimate the variance for time one and time two, and we'll see that they are a little bit different. So we get 0.865 at pre and 0.423 at post for GPA. Are these statistically significantly different from each other? That could be a question that you want to know the answer to, but as far as assumptions go, it's not an assumption of the paired sample t-test. At least I haven't found anything compelling to suggest it is. And I think one of the reasons that's the case is that when you have equal numbers of cases across both levels, and that's always true in a paired sample t-test, you need to have paired observations. So you're going to have the same number of observations in both variables. And in this case, we have 45 and 45 observations, even though they're from the same person. Because it's equal, the assumption of homogeneity of variance, I think, is really not an issue for the paired sample t-test. So people don't ever really look at it, and I can't find any research to suggest that you should, because the p-value will be accurate either way. So those are the assumptions of the paired sample t-test, and as I mentioned in the textbook, you should be looking at this before you conduct the analysis, but I wrote the textbook in such a way that we got into the analysis first because it's more interesting and then cover the assumptions later. That's not because I think assumptions are important. I definitely think they're important.